Hello and welcome back to Guillotine, 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to talk about covalent compounds. Surprisingly very little about naming covalent compounds, they're pretty easy to name. Uh, but we will spend most of the time talking about some of the uh, structure and properties of covalent compounds. And uh, once you know that, you'll get a better idea of why they have a different naming system. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get these guys separated here. And so let's just quickly review ionic compounds. Remember that ionic compounds are going to form when atoms gain or lose electrons. Uh, those ions are attracted to each other and they end up forming uh, strong crystal lattices. And that, that leads to a lot of strength. These are metals and nonmetals making these kinds of bonds. So you're going to get something from the left side of the periodic table bonding with something from the right side of the periodic table. But uh, as we've talked about, this is not the only kind of bond uh, atoms can form. And the other type is the uh, covalent bond course we're going to talk about today. So, sorry Ionic, you've uh, certainly shined the rest of this unit, but we're going to talk about something else. <laughs> so a covalent bond is caused when atoms share electrons to get full valence shells as opposed to transfer them. And I, I uh, showed you a little bit about this during the polyatomic lesson. I showed you a little bit about how carbon and oxygen would get together and transfer electrons. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about uh, molecular structures and uh, trying to show how things actually bond together. But the basic idea is that they share electrons to get to eight. And therefore, uh, since we're sharing electrons, um, these are typically between two nonmetals, and they are not strong enough to dominate one another. And so they ended up sharing the electrons between them. And so if you're sharing electrons, you're not making ions. And if you're not making ions, you're not making crystal lattices. And so all the, all, everything we know about compounds so far really gets thrown out the window. And so instead of these giant crystal lattices, you have individual molecules. So when we say NaCl, remember we're representing a giant crystal lattice. Uh, but when we're talking about something like water or methane, CH4 for instance, uh, we are actually talking about a discrete molecule that within its borders has only one carbon and four hydrogens. And again, that, that, that's going to open up uh, properties between molecules that you really don't see in ionic compounds because ionic compounds, everything's chemically bonded together. Little joke there about ions. <laughs> and so what we have is a, uh, a kind of a push-pull between the different atoms in a covalent bond. Uh, protons and electrons from each other are going to attract each other, but the like charges are going to repel each other. And so what's going to happen is every single uh, type of covalent bond is going to find its own ideal distance, where you have the right push and pull um, to lower potential energy. Notice that it, this would be negative 436 kilojoules per mole. Again, that's just an example for diatomic hydrogen. But at that, that, at that distance, it's the most stable and has the lowest potential energy. And that ties in nicely to the energy hill we've talked about before. But as these things start getting farther apart, uh, you'll start seeing them uh, uh, gain potential energy until they're separated. And so if you notice left to right there, that's the old classic energy hill. At the bottom, they formed a stable compound, and at the top, uh, they've been separate, uh, and, and they're no longer considered in a bond. Interestingly enough, if you start pushing them together, though, they start becoming more unstable because then you start having a lot more of those repulsion forces. So there is an ideal distance. And the interesting thing also is that covalent bonds are a lot more flexible than ionic bonds. In fact, uh, there's um, even equipment out there that actually measures the vibrations and the different types of vibrations in covalent compounds to help determine what kind of molecules we have. So just keep that in mind as we talk about this kind of stuff. And I do apologize for this joke. Hippo, run. <laughs> anyway, so what are some of the big differences this leads to? Um, well, ionic compounds have really high melting and boiling points. We talked about the reason why is because of the, the strong 3D lattice. Well, covalent compounds don't have that. Um, a covalent compound uh, certainly has strong chemical bonds, um, but they are not chemically bound to each other. So if you want to melt an ionic compound, you have to overcome it, chemical bonds. You don't have any other choice. That's all the interactions there are. But in this case, in the, in the case of a covalent molecule, uh, you might you don't even you don't have to break a chemical bond because you can break the much weaker uh, physical interaction between molecules. And we're going to talk a lot more about these physical interactions later. These are called intermolecular forces. 
Um, it's sort of like, remember, think of the game like Red Robin when you were a child. Um, you know, if you're holding hands with somebody and somebody tries to break through, uh, odds are you're not going to get your arm ripped off um, because you've got strong internal forces. Uh, but where it's going to break uh, is the interaction between you and another person, the handshake. And that's how it is with covalent molecules. Um, we're really not testing the strength of the chemical bond because something much weaker breaks beforehand. And so a lot of people say that covalent bonds are weak because of this, but that's, that's not true at all. That's a misconception. Uh, remember, they can be really strong bonds. We got like diatomic nitrogen. That's a triple bond. Uh, but uh, there are very weak forces between molecules. So now I know, and of course that's half the battle. And here we go again. So get these guys out of here. So with, with those kind of ideas of covalent compounds uh, behind us, uh, what makes us realize we need a different naming system. If we're not forming ions, then we can't assume that the chemist knows what atoms are in there. That worked for ionic compounds because when I say that you have aluminum oxide, um, I know what charge aluminum has, I know what charge oxide has. But when I say that I have some kind of carbon oxygen compound, well, I don't have charges. So I don't have that information to give the chemist anymore. Um, and, and carbon and oxygen have a lot of different ways to get to full valence shells by sharing. And so what we need to do then is we have to actually physically specify the number of atoms in the compound. Of course, we'll pause for a uh, covalent joke before we talk about the naming. So we, for ionic system, we use the stock system that uses the uh, numbers that indicated charge. Uh, um, but for the covalent system, we're actually going to use prefixes to indicate amount. And that's a big difference. Um, because again, we don't have the charges to fall back on. And so you have to know some prefixes. Once you know the prefixes, though, this is, this is actually very, very, very easy. Because again, you just have to, it's, it's WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And, and you just simply have to tell the reader how many of each you have. All right. And so here are the classic um, prefixes you'll need. Notice these are a little different than the prefixes we learned early in the year, uh, like mega and deca, um, uh, because we're dealing with different things here. Um, but nonetheless, um, you, you know most of these already. Some of these might be a little new. Uh, penta, uh, hexa, hepta, octa. Uh, interestingly enough, tetra, uh, tetra, tetris. Those are four uh, piece figures that fell from the sky. And now when you combine these with uh, uh, elements uh, or ions that start with uh, vowels, then you have to, you know, figure out what gets dropped. So it'll take a little bit of time to uh, get used to putting the prefix together with the element correctly. Um, and, but the only other rule is, uh, for if you only have one of the first element, you drop the prefix mono. Um, so that, that's pretty straightforward. And we still have I, D, E at the end of them. And so for the answer of P2O3, now some people might want to name that ionically, but if we named it covalently, since it's you know two nonmetals, um, you've got diphosphorus trioxide, and that's how easy it is, all right. And obviously we know CO2 is carbon dioxide, and that's where the name comes from, not monocarbon dioxide. Uh, even water, uh, you know, you might be tempted to call it dihydrogen monoxide, but nobody calls it dihydrogen monoxide. It's just called water. And so um, let's talk about some practice problems here. All right, so uh, you know, go ahead and take a, take a minute and answer these. I'll come back. Okay, so there we go. So again, easy uh, carbon tetrachloride, right? One carbon, four chlorines. Uh, one sulfur, two oxygens, sulfur dioxide. Again, super easy. After ionic, this is sort of just dessert. Sulfur trioxide, um, chlorine trifluoride. Now remember, though, if, if the first element is a uh, typical anion, uh, you still don't make it ide, so it actually becomes chlorine trifluoride. The ide still only belongs to the one at the end. And then for the last one, of course, it would be phosphorus trichloride. Going the other way, it's just as easy. So you've got, uh, in this case, um, arsenic pentafluoride. All right, so you know that you're going to have five of them there. Silicon dioxide, SiO2, bromine trifluoride, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen pentoxide. <laughs> so they, they're very, very, very simple. 
Um, so, I, you know, I've, I've certainly enjoyed uh, being in the studio with you. Uh, these guys have enjoyed being there also for you. Uh, bringing in a little Top Gun reference there. They had a good time there. Even the high neck compound had a little bit of fun. <laughs> so that took a, a little longer than 10 minutes there to wrap all that up. Uh, but uh, you now know how to name uh, pretty much every compound you'll need to as a, as a first year chemistry student. Now, what we didn't get into is organic naming. Um, that's outside of the realm of the typical first year chemistry class. Um, but uh, there are plenty of resources out there for organic naming. That's a lot of fun. So I hope you enjoyed our final lesson in the basics of compounds and naming. Uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day. And we'll see you next week.